Okay, well, welcome to Airy Real Talk. Woo! Yes, the energy is amazing tonight. I know it's because we've got free amazing baked goods. Uh, that's why everyone's here, plus it isn't like 110 today, so that's a win. Um, but no, we're so excited to have you all. And tonight's theme is about serving strength, passion and power. All things that, regardless of what industries you're in, it's relatable because we want to harness our inner power and our inner passions um, and be a light in this world. So what I want to do is start off by introducing three radiant lights right here. So come on, ladies. Let's do a little bit. Te also, tell us like one funny thing about you or one thing we might not know whilst you introduce yourself. No pressure. Anyone can go first, by oh, the way. Okay. <laughs> Hi, friends. Um, yeah, thank you guys all for coming. My name's Amita Kasem, and I started a bakery named Flower Shop. And you might already know this, but my favorite color is rainbow. <laughs> and I believe in unicorns. Oh. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, I'm Kristen Tomlin. I'm the founder and CEO of Dough. We specialize in edible cookie dough. Um, we're based right here in New York City. And my fun fact, I also believe in unicorns. Mm -hmm. um, and they are real. They are real. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the talk is about tonight, <laughs> unicorns. Um, I have a rescue puppy that I love very much Aww. named Nellie. That's my fun fact. Hi everybody, I'm Brienne. Um, I'm a chef activist, so I'm a chef and I'm an activist. You might have known me from Women's March. I'm one of the founders. Um, oh God, fun fact about me. I read tarot cards. Ooh. Yeah. Should I we read tarot cards. I mean, I don't have them with me, but maybe next time. You have had a serious cue then of everyone trying to get right. the cards <laughs> Okay, so I really want to obviously know how did you all get into cooking and baking? How did that all start? What was the spark that ignited your passion? I'll start. Yeah. Um, I started baking actually at a very young age. I was always next to my mom in the kitchen. There were four of us growing up very close in age and my mom's attention was um, very limited, and so the only time I could get her attention when I was in the kitchen with her. Um, she's a chef and loved uh, savory, but she hated the actual preciseness of baking and didn't have a huge sweet tooth, but I did. So I kind of took over all of the baking in the house at a very young age and secretly was doing it also so that I could just sneak uh, shovel cookie dough in my mouth <laughs> when my mom was looking away. Um, and cookie dough remained my guilty pleasure for as long as I can remember all throughout high school and college. I always had a tub of it in my fridge or freezer. Um, and I came up with the idea of dough when I was with a bunch of girlfriends, because what else do you do? You go to a bakery and we went to a cookie shop. But instead of getting any of the freshly baked cookies that they had, they had, they were selling their tubs of cookie dough for you to take home and bake and have, you know, fresh baked bakery style cookies at home. And we just grabbed the tub and went to the car and didn't get any baked goods at all. So we sat there and ate this tub of cookie dough as we had many other times. But that was really the light bulb moment for me that I thought, why is this not a thing? We all want to just eat cookie dough. Now we're going to be worried for the rest of the day. Is it going to make us sick? How are we going to feel? I also wanted in all these other flavors. And so that kind of sparked my idea for dough. Wow. Very cool. I have been one of those people that's queued up for dough. Yeah. Just to let you Amazing. know. Amazing. Thank I you. <laughs> yeah. I remember when it came to New York and I was, I was like, oh. And then the queue was massive, but you know, prevailed, went for it, got two scoops, couldn't finish them all, but yeah. I was like, had it in my fridge for ages, so there you go. Thank you. <laughs> I can think of like three nights that's happened this year where I've gone to dough and it just felt better. Amazing. Like, oh, it just makes that's everything better. <laughs> um, well, I'll go next. So I also started at a very young age. Um, my mom's side is Spanish, so to, the, cooking is a big part of our culture. Um, and then my dad's side, um, my grandmother was like the OG baker for the church. Like if anybody ever had a birthday or a wedding cake, like she was on it. So I was always baking like when I was younger, but when I was 16, my grandmother was like, all right, I'm gonna show you how to properly decorate a cake. 
and she got me and my sister and did the whole Wilton set. We did the buttercream roses, like the whole thing. And I was, that was like the only thing I was better at than my sister. <laughs> so I was like, cool, I'm gonna be a professional like cake decorator. Um, and I started just decorating um, everybody's cakes too. My grandma started kind of giving me her clients. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that just kind of morphed into um, me deciding that if I really wanted to take my career as a chef seriously, I needed to move to New York. And I was also, I'm from Detroit, so at that point too, um, Detroit was really in the um, economic crisis, and people couldn't even pay their mortgage, let alone get a cake for fun. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a pretty tough time, but um, I made the move out here, and totally paid off. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking a little bit about like the vibes of restaurants and the challenges, especially as women, we can face. Um, but it's just been an amazing journey so far. And I, in 2016, um, I had done cookies for Hillary Clinton's campaign and was pretty like, pretty shocked when she didn't win, like a lot of people in the country. Um, not everyone was shocked, though. Some people mm -hmm. expected that. Um, but I was able to just kind of evaluate what was going on and just think, OK, like, what can we do to fix this? <laughs> like, going into chef mentality, like, the kitchen's on fire. Like, how are people going to get dinner tonight? Um, and that's when the whole idea of a march came about. And there was other women around the country thinking the same thing. So women coming together, making history, making change um, happen, and really trying to give a voice to the people that aren't being heard right now. Okay, well, now I have to follow up to that. So. <laughs> you have gone first. Um, yeah, I should have gone first. Um, I combined a little bit of them, too, because I, too, come from a Latin background. My mother's from Mexico, my father's from Kuwait, so I'm kind of all over the map. Um, and I grew up baking with my mom, and that was just something that was really fun for me, and it was never, you know, just, it was always for someone. It was my friend's birthday, it was my teacher's whatever, it was, it was the male's man this, that. Like, everything was a very thought-out thing. And at a very young age, I realized that making things for people, whether it's like writing a card or baking a cake, that it, there was just a very genuine way of spreading joy, um, whether it was because they needed it or because they didn't. But I saw the light in people when you, know, you deliver a cake to someone and you see their face. And, and whatever that means to them, that just meant a lot to me. And I always loved that, but I also loved um, fashion. And I never thought of baking as a career for myself. And I grew up in Mexico, and I moved to the US. I went to fashion school in LA. And then I moved to New York because I wanted to work in high-end fashion. So I was working at a lot of different magazines and companies. And the whole time I was doing that, subconsciously, I was you know, baking the whole time, whether it was because I started a new job or it was my boss's birthday. And I got to a point in New York where they kept asking me, you know, where did you buy this cake? Can we shoot it in this magazine? And I just kind of thought to myself, like, should I put that I can bake on my resume? Everyone seems to be impressed in New York. Like, what's happening in Mexico? It was just like I was the girl who made cakes. Um, and so I started doing it more and more. They were asking me, like, uh, where did you buy it? And I'd be like, I made it. And they'd say, but it's in a box. And like, you can buy a box. That's really easy. <laughs> Everyone sells boxes. Um, so more and more it started, you know, putting it in my head that that's what made me happy, that even though I had worked in the fashion industry for eight years and that's what I went to school to and that's what you know I learned, that I just had a passion for spreading joy through the power of sprinkles. <laughs> um, and I woke up one day and I was like, that's it. I want to wake up and play with sprinkles for the rest of my life. And it was a real thing. Um, and it was a huge risk, but I did it, and that's kind of where everything started. I love that and I love the bit you touched on where you said you know really taking time to create and bake something really gives people joy and I feel like in this world of immediacy and wanting like instant gratification I think knowing someone has really invested that time and energy um, and also just because it is so precise like really knowing that they really cared that much to kind of put that much effort into something is so beautiful nowadays. It is and it's also something to me where 
a lot of what we do is customize, whether it's writing someone's name on a cake or you know their favorite food as a cake or whatever. It really is about that person, right? When you make a cake for someone or you're celebrating in any way, um, you know, I'm sure when you see like little kids grab that dough and their faces light up, you're just like, I just made someone's day. Yeah. And so a part of me feels like I celebrate everyone's birthday. <laughs> and it's shareable, so you're not only just making that one person happy, you're making everyone in the room like, okay. <laughs> um, so I wanted to, again, touch on the point that you said about being in an industry that has traditionally been male dominated. As a female, how did you push through? How did you find that success? What has that journey looked like for you all? Well, I figured this out pretty young. So when I was in high school, I got a scholarship to attend the local community college in Detroit. So for like three semesters, I was doing all the basic classes. I think I wanted to be an accountant because I was like, oh, I'm good at math. That sounds like a great career. Like I had no idea what I was doing. And um, it was the last semester of my senior year. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take something fun. Like I bake all the time. Like. I'm a great cake decorator, clearly, because I'm better than my sister. And so I saw this baking class, and I thought it was home ec. I'm like, cool. I watch Martha Stewart all the time. Like, got this. And I walk in. I was like 16 or 17 at this point. I walk in to a room full of men that have been just out of prison. They're firemen, out of the military. Like, I am the only woman period and I'm like 16 or 17. So right then I realized, okay, this isn't home ec, like this is something else. And the chef was like, you're in culinary school. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm in culinary school. And I ended up going through the whole program. Um, and you know, throughout my whole career, I've often found myself, as I'm sure you ladies have as well, where I am the only woman. Um, and it's always been interesting as, you know, rising up the ranks and seeing the shift um, in the industry, too, where more women are saying, you know what, no, I can pursue this as a career. I can be an executive chef. Like, I, I can make this happen for myself. I don't have to put up with this male-dominated industry. And I have a voice. Um, and it was challenging, too, especially when I was a cook, because it was there was very little support. There was not a big support system at all. And you know, you're, you're already just physically being put through the ringer. <laughs> and women, our bodies are just different than men's. And so to have those challenges as well. Um, finding out that the menu changed when everybody was at the strip club the night before. And I'm walking into a different menu. Like a lot of conversations happening in male spaces that did exclude me. Um, but then I remember like three years into the restaurant, this girl named Charlotte came in. And then a girl named Erin came in. And then a girl named Adriana came in. And more women started coming in. And you started seeing the shift in the restaurant. And as I. Um, became a sous chef and eventually an executive chef, I really made it a point to really, I mean, interview everybody, but try to really find the women out there, and especially women that needed opportunities, women of color, immigrants, undocumented people, people that have been in the system and are looking for another chance. Like The industry is really, the backbone of our industry is people that are undocumented and immigrants, people of color. So to really be able to give jobs and opportunities is just like one of the most joyous things you'll ever experience in this industry. It's fantastic. And both of you, did you find um, that in a male-dominated industry, there was times when you had to push through or you had to take a step back and think, OK, how can I one up? Or you know, what's my? my trump card, you know, what is going to help me get past and get through these challenges? Yeah, I, I think when I first started, um, I was working in design and consulting before I left to, to start dough. Um, but when I told people I was starting a cookie dough company, the response from most people, including women, but especially men, was like, oh, that's cute. And that was it was like, yeah, it is cute, but that's not, I'm not like starting like a little, like, my plan is not to do like a little Etsy shop, 
nothing on, I think that is a great place to start, Go, don't get me wrong, but I had bigger dreams and plans and even explaining it to people was like, no, it's not just gonna be this like little thing. Sure, I'm starting out of my home kitchen and I'm figuring it out, but like, I wanna build a company. Mm -hmm. and, and I was also young um, and I think a lot of people just were like doubtful about what I was doing. Um, but for me, that just gave me more reason to kind of prove them wrong and work even harder and do exactly what I set out to do in the beginning. Yeah. And I just quickly want to touch on that. For anyone out there that is thinking, what is that step? What is it? How do you get from baking in your kitchen to having a storefront, to having a business, to eventually franchising? Um, did you get VC? What did that look like? How did you kind of take those first steps, like business plans? Just kind of sharing with everyone out there. Yeah, from my experience, um, I bootstrapped the business from nothing. I, like I said, I started in my kitchen. I started with what I knew, and what I knew was I knew how to bake, and I knew about branding, because that's what my career was prior. Um, and then I'm very much the mentality that I can figure a lot of other shit out um, if I just put my head down and do some research and put some hard work in. And so that's exactly what I did, is I built my business little by little, like Lego block by Lego block, and I was able um, to fund it myself that way and use any money that I made to build out our first kitchen and then use profits from that to build out our storefront and then use profits from that to kind of continue to expand the business. Um, so that was my personal choice. Um, there are so many ways to build a business today, especially with the options that are available with fundraising and so many, so many different things. But I'm proud to say I own 100% of my business and I can make whatever decision I want. Um, and yeah, it's worked, it's worked for me. And um, my advice to people that are wanting to start something or have an idea is to start somewhere and just keep moving forward. Doesn't matter how quickly you move, just move in some sort of forward direction. Start with what you know and then figure out the stuff that you don't know. Yeah, you can and I think it's it. very important as females, um, we are less inclined to have conversations about money, about starting businesses, about get, taking out loans, about banks, just all of those kind of languages of finances and money and saving even. Um, we're not really having those communities, uh, places to speak of in female communities. So I think that there's a really important takeaway that we can all have today where it's like let's be more open let's support each other let's talk about that let's share and give each other advice because um, that's one thing financial freedom is just such a huge imperative part if you have a passion turning into a business you've got to know how to save you've got to know how to take those steps and we can educate ourselves it just takes some extra work but um, it's really nice when we can share our own experiences and help each other um, yeah and I think for me you know I have kind of an opposite story to you where I came from a female dominated industry. The fashion industry is heavily, heavily women. And there is some fierce people. There's people like Anna Wintour, which like, she's just a boss. Like there's nothing else to say, right? And I was able to sort of take that mentality and take everything that I learned from whether it was growing up in the environment that I was raised in or being in the fashion industry that I was able to head into this male dominated industry without even thinking about the boys like who cares I'm here this is my spotlight and this is how I'm going to do it so I wasn't necessarily you know bumping elbows with with men in a kitchen but I think that I used anything that I could as being a woman and as being as real to myself to get myself ahead, right? And so if I know that as a woman who, who started in fashion, then I can use that to my advantage. The first clients I had were in fashion. And if I didn't come from that background, if I was you know, a chef, a male chef, learning you know, at a culinary school, I might not be getting jobs like that. I might not be getting to do um, amazing things for fashion week or museums or the art side. So, I actually dove deep down into being a girl and what being a woman meant to me. And even if it did mean nurturing through joy of baking, like that's awesome that we can create that and do that. And I think that, you know, whatever, I love glitter and rainbows and unicorns and that's who I am. And guess what? There's like a million other people who do too. So I think for me, it was more about staying real to myself as a woman than trying to fight against the male thing because there is a spotlight for everyone and as long as you're focusing on shining yourself and lifting up other women and supporting other women 
however that means, whether it's hiring women. I mean, my shop, like you, I'm so proud to say, there's so much diversity, mostly women because of the industry of baking, and my husband, <laughs> who is sitting up here, is so proud to like have a company where most of the decisions are made by women, and I am the boss, and we do do everything together, and I think that that's the environment you create and you work with, and as you grow, same thing. And I also started out of baking out of my tiny oven in Brooklyn, and we were just joking about how any order that came in, whether I knew how to do it, or I had enough time, or whatever, I made fake emails, like, literally there was like press at flower shop, and like, orders at flower, like all these emails were made, and I was answering all of them. Um, so like, fake it till you make it definitely worked for me. Sorry, Mike. Um, and I answered all of them, and I played the different roles, and like you said, like talking about money, you know, it was hard for me in the beginning because I don't want to be like, yes, here's your, you know, five-year-old's birthday, it's like sparkles and this. Also, can you pay me? Like, that's like a very weird vibe. So I think for me, I found a route to being like, well, here's the person that invoices you. And it was also me, but it just came from a different person, <laughs> different email. And I think that, that for me, yeah, that was the hustle for me where I didn't have to think about putting on my two hats, whether I was business me or creative fun me. It was like, I'm both, and you can see it however you want, but like, here I am. And little by little, you know, we were able to I'm, raise like enough or like save enough. I remember my first cake that I sold, I called my mom and I was like, mom, someone paid for a cake I made. <laughs> and I bought another pan so that, cause the rainbows <laughs> are like six layers. And I was like, I'm gonna sell another one. I'm gonna get a mixer because I was doing everything by hand. And literally it was every cake I sold, it was like, I need to pay my rent. And then what can I buy for my kitchen? It was making the sacrifices for me was what it was. Like, no, you don't need to go out to dinner with your friends. No, you don't need to like shop. You need a mixer. Like, <laughs> and those were just the balances that I was making. And I walk down the street to Lafayette to our shop and I see a full team and literally I almost cry because I'm like, this started with like one cake. And so it is very slow. That took me six years, I think it was. I'm not good at math, but I'm good at baking. Um, <laughs> I don't know how that works. <laughs> Your math probably helps you with baking. Um, and, and I think that that's just really cool to start from something. It took six years and it's very real now. I, I always thought it would be a brand because to me, Flower Shop is spreading joy, it's not just baking cakes. And so the fact that we've been able to expand now from the bakery to, you know, collections with Williams-Sonoma, we have different licensing deals, you can eat off my dinnerware, like that's really cool because it all started with like that one cake. Yeah, gosh, your journeys are all truly, truly inspiring. Um, and I guess I want to know if you had one piece of advice that you want to give anyone out there who's starting off, no matter what industry, just like a little nugget or maybe something you wish you knew when you were getting started. Because that's honestly the, the hardest thing is taking that first step from the one cake to being like, oh, I'm going to sell it. And then it, like, how do you take that first step? Any gifts we can give to everyone? I'll just follow it up with yeah. what I was saying. But I think the most important thing for me is that, and you know, I never went to culinary school. I didn't know what I was doing. It was just from like fun. Right, And when you sometimes get too lost in the technique and what you're supposed to be doing, what other businesses are doing, what are the trends, whatever, whatever, who cares? Like, again, like stay real to yourself. Like I cannot say that enough because for me, it was that I grew up in Mexico and I missed piñatas at birthdays. And so I wanted a cake that like acted like a piñata and like, ta-da, the cover of my book, right? So like, I think that things like that were really important for me that like I messed up so many times like that cake failed so many times at first I put like um, like lollipops and chocolate bars and all these things and you cut it and they were all just like stuck in there I was like mm, okay <laughs> not working and so just sticking to something that is you until it works is really important and not looking at what anyone else is doing because it's very easy when I was opening, they're like, well, what is this bakery doing? And did you see what that bakery is doing? And which one sells better for them? And you know, what are these chefs doing? 
again, who cares? Because <laughs> what your ideas, and, and I pull my inspiration from like my childhood, my inner happiness, my whatever, and now I look around and there's so many of these bakeries that were like the big bakeries to me doing a version of my cake, and that's really cool. So I think that if you just stick to yourself and never compare yourself to what's out there, then that's the best thing for me. I love that. That's so airy real. Like we're really trying to encourage everyone as part of this movement to just embrace who they are. And I feel like the more you stay in your own lane and you stop comparing yourself or you stop almost compromising and shrinking yourself to fit into someone else's box, like that's when, you know, those obstacles appear and you second guess, you just gotta keep listening to that intuition. So I would love to know your advice, both of you. Yeah, I mean I agree. I think that's the only way you can really stand out. It's I think there's Today, it's really hard to break into any industry and to be different. And the only way that you can be different is to truly be your authentic self. Whatever that means, you need to dig deep and figure that out and like stay your path with, with whatever that is. Um, my other advice would be you're going to have to make some sacrifices. Like you said, you're going to have to you know, give up some free time, spend your money elsewhere. You really need to make sure that you're, um, you know, thinking about your end goal, even from the beginning. And also recognize what you know, what you know you know, and what you don't know you don't know, and that's okay to ask for help. Um, you can't do it all. I like, you know, also when I started, I was a one woman show and um, definitely tried to do it all, but you can't do everything under the sun. So just know that and it's okay to ask for help. Um, ask advice from all of your friends, all of the people around you, um, any, you know, any friend that was, a, an accountant or a lawyer or you know a consumer even I would constantly call them and ask them for advice because I was just always in search of you know answers and um, and it's okay to ask for help Love that so I'm a perfectionist um, <laughs> and this is actually a lesson I think really honed in this year if I'm gonna be really honest with you guys um, don't burn out <laughs> like try to really be kind to yourself and like you said like this happened six, year, six years in the making you know and while you were hustling like yes hustle but also put boundaries down because it's so easy to just like really burn yourself down to nothing and then it's so hard to pick yourself back up sometimes like I remember when I was trying to, um, I was working at a Michelin star restaurant and I had just made sous chef. So I was like, cool, like I, I wanted to just put everything into it. And I put on way too much I could handle. Like I would get to the restaurant at 7 a.m. and I was leave until the last table left, which would sometimes be 2 a.m. And the restaurant was only closed on Sundays. So I would be there six days a week. Um, sometimes I wouldn't even eat all day because I would be tasting the um, desserts throughout the whole day. So my mind thought like, oh, you're eating like sugar like a little bit um, throughout the day. And then I would get off work and be like, oh my God, I didn't eat all day. And then I became best friends with my 24 hour diner. Um, they still know my name. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I went down that road for like three years um, and then kind of did another turn and burn <laughs> with the activism space, which that's a whole other conversation. Um, but to be really just, yes, have your vision board, have your mood board, have your goals, but don't beat yourself up if you don't check everything off the list. Like, it's okay to take a break, it's okay to take a breath, and like, believe me when I tell you, it is so much better in the long run to, like, you know that fable of the tortoise and the hare? Like, be the tortoise. Like, I've been the hare before, and like, it sucks. Like, be the tortoise, just show up every day, and really find that passion, too. Like, I think that that's a common theme. No matter what industry you're in, you have to find the thing that's gonna get you out of bed in those moments when you just don't wanna leave. Like, those moments when you just feel so drained or you feel discouraged for whatever reason. There's so many challenges that happen, especially living in a place like New York City. So really surround yourself with people that get it, that people that will say, hey, when's the last time you had a real meal? Or when's the last time you did something for yourself? Or 
let's just chill today. Like, we don't have to be running around. Like, have a network like that that can really look out for you. And then be able to do the same thing for your tribe. It's important to surround yourself with people that are like-minded. And, you know, iron sharpens iron. So when you're in a community like that and you find that community, whether it's in your industry or whether it's a passion project, that is just going to help you thrive in no matter what industry you're in. I love that. So is there anyone on your journeys that you felt inspired you or influenced you and has helped you get where you are today? There's a lot of people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't think I have time to name them all. Um, I think my earliest inspiration was my mom, who, like I said, is a, is a chef. She always encouraged us to follow our dreams and do whatever made us happy. And um, so she has been just a huge support in anything that I've ever tried or failed in. Um, and then secondly, I, my husband is incredibly important um, and incredibly supportive with anything and everything that I could have ever asked for. So I got very lucky there. I like exactly the same thing as her, <laughs> weirdly enough. But my mom definitely, you know, she, I always say she was Pinterest mom before Pinterest was a thing. Um, and like everything she made for me, like every day I would open my lunchbox and there would literally be like just art. And I, wow. I was like, what time did she do this? I've been with her every day. Like, so, so she was really inspiring in, in a sense of creativity and the spreading joy for people. I mean, anyone that's met my mom just feels like a happier human, I think. Um, and, and just, yeah, on the business side, I would say my husband. And in a very, he plays a very, very large role of everything that I do. And you know, I was baking six years out of my apartment, and finally I was like, we need to open, I want to open a shop, and, you know, he was just my boyfriend then, and then we got engaged right around that time, and I was looking to hire someone to help me with the things that I didn't understand, like you said, and, and there's a lot that goes into a physical, you know, retail, food facility, yeah. whatever you want to call it, where there's a kitchen, everything, and it was everything from, like, what's a grease trap to like, did you do your taxes right? Like, why did they teach us that in school? There was just so many things. And so I was looking to hire so for who that partner was gonna be for me. And I was just kept hiring, like interviewing people every day. And I was like, I don't know if I could trust this person with something that I built for six years and just have a stranger come in and hope they're doing the right thing because I don't really know. And he came home from work one day and he's like, this is it, I'm gonna leave my job, and I'm opening flower shop with you. And I was like, oh, I always wanted that, but I never wanted to be the one to ask him because I never wanted to be like, you left your job for this. Um, clearly it was the passion of his and something that he felt really passionate, whether it was in supporting or in creating a space for himself to have his own business, but he's been Sorry, I'm really embarrassing you, but <laughs> he has been a huge support. And I think that you, you really need someone like that that you can trust. And I think trust is more important than anything else because he is colorblind and I'm obsessed with rainbows. He's lactose intolerant and everything we do has dairy. <laughs> he has never cooked in his life before flower shop, let alone worked at a kitchen or a bakery and had never run a business. And literally, I'm talking about everything that could have gone wrong is who he is. And it didn't matter because I trusted him. I know that there's, he is going to research everything that I don't have time to do. And, and it's gonna be the best because he cares and because I trust him, not because he knows the best. And I think that when I think about people who inspire me is, Someone that I could just be myself and trust and like believe that they're looking out for me. Like you said, he's my tribe. Um, so those are two of my most important ones. <laughs> So I think when I look back on different phases of my life, there's always been like somebody that's really helped me through that phase. Um, I think right now I would say my partner, um, and it's amazing because he's six seven, so he's like a bottomless pet. So I can just test recipes all I want, and he'll eat it, and he'll tell me like, "Oh yeah, it was good." But then when I get like the like. Mm, like kind of like like the head nod and the, then I'm like okay that's a winner like so it's really fun like having somebody to that's supportive and 
making sure like my fridge is cleaned out every day. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, actually though, I today is a special day for me because um, my cousin Rachel, who's my best friend, um, she was termina terminally ill um, my whole life and she passed away when she was 18. Um, but today would have been her 27th birthday. Um, and so I'm actually really happy to be here. Um, and it's a good reminder of just, you know, life is short and to be able to follow your dreams and to be able to, um, you know, just have such a personal experience with somebody that was terminally ill and just watching the way her outlook on life was, even though she was only 18, like, she really lived her life to the fullest. And even though, um, you know, I was very young when I lost her too, and I had just moved to the city, so I was like 21 or 22, um, it really taught me to be able to just really embrace every part of the process and enjoy it. And at the end of the day, like, you really do only have one life. And yeah, it can be scary following your dreams. Yeah, it can be hard. Like, yeah, sometimes it's you want to give up or it's just exhausting wearing all those hats, especially in the beginning. But to be able to really just try to honor her life um, by following through with my dreams was the best way I thought I could do that. And you've done that, and she'd be so proud. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I can feel her. Yeah. Well, tonight is now dedicated to her. Yeah. Yes. Happy birthday. Happy yes. 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 birthday. We'll all eat some cake. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> There's actually one more person, and she's going to kill me for this, but Lacey. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just because she's sitting in the front row, but Lacey's my right hand. And I'll tell you a little story about Lacey, because this is another person that literally inspires me every single day. Like, she's not just a support system where she knows what she's doing. She's actually inspiring to, like, people around her. Like, anyone that meets her, she's really inspiring to. But she runs basically everything. She's an executive assistant to, like, everything flower shop. She designs everything. She does everything with me. And this just goes to show how I met Lacey. But same story kind of to Ross. But she walked into flower shop. And I was just like, wow, that is the coolest girl I've ever seen. <laughs> and I just went up to her and was like, hey, take a picture of you. Like, she always looks amazing. Um, and I put it on my social media, like something, a story. And someone wrote me, was like, how do you know Lacey? She's amazing. And I was like, I don't know, but I think we should be friends. <laughs> and um, I wrote her and I was like, I don't know who you are or what you do or like what anything, but like, do you want to work at Flower Shop? <laughs> like, I just thought she was the coolest girl ever. And she came in and literally the weirdest interview ever because I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know what position it's for. I don't know anything. But she was just so inspiring to be around, to how she sees the world, to how she embraces color and the use of it, and just really understanding humans and how to communicate and all of that teaches me a lot because there's sometimes where I get really frustrated and she brings me down or there's sometimes where I'm like there's 1700 decisions to make today how do I do this by myself can't ask colorblind Ross so like, <laughs> so and Lacey's just like this should be here and that should be there move this and I'm like oh my gosh everybody needs Lacey in their lives and I think that that also was that I just loved who she was versus what she can do. And that seems to be a common theme in my life is to collect people that, you know, your tribe. Mm -hmm. So I want to also go back to the Women's March um, just quickly. I don't know how much time we have left. Anyone give me a 10? OK, so we have to, we have to, OK. So I just want to, this is huge. Women's March is something that goes down in history um, as a moment where we all felt that solidarity. Um, and again, I feel like it was a creation of something that could have been, um, <laughs> I'll be careful with my words, frustrating. And you made something that was so positive and of a coming together and a time to, to feel really proud to be a woman in this world. So do you have any advice to anyone out there? How do you get into activism? Oh, man. I know, it's a long uh, one. It, it's a long you one. Have much time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say um, show up. 
<laughs> show up. Um, and if you are not an impacted person, if you are white, <laughs> then listen, um, learn. There's people in this space that have been doing the work. And it's important to just be showing up, put your ego aside, understand that this work has been happening for many, many generations. And history repeats itself. And that's something, even though you know it was new to me four years ago, um, I've been listening and learning a lot these past four years and understanding the history and understanding the people that fought for our rights before us, especially the women. Um, so yeah, like I think that's like the first thing to do. Um, <laughs> just show up and listen. Um, and I'm actually really excited, too, because I've been finding in my learnings the past four years is that food is what connects people. Like, in, like that is the one thing that is just consistently connecting people. Like, if you go in the deep south and you go to a good restaurant, like, you're going to see every community there, like you're gonna see all kinds of different backgrounds and people um, in different places of their lives showing up over that good meal. So I'm actually really excited. I'm gonna be launching something in the next couple weeks um, <laughs> um, called Stir the Nation, where I'm gonna be doing a 50 state cooking tour. I'm partnering with local activists and local chefs and people in the restaurant industry to be able to hold space and have these discussions leading up to 2020 and using food to really drive a lot of these conversations. Conversations. Woo, that's so exciting. Oh, yes. A little sneak preview. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, we'll have to find out the date. Woo. Okay, so I wanted to do a quick flash round. Um, and these are really, really important questions that we need to know. What is in your fridge right now? Limes. <laughs> okay. Love citrus. Celery. Pickles. Oh, yeah. I've never tried a pickle. What? Disclaimer. Oh, we also yeah. just learned. Yes. Sorry, Jill, I'm English. I yeah. learned that for the first time, she had not had grilled cheese. What? And so, yeah. Oh my one goodness. Of her first somebody made her grilled cheese. cheese. Well, with her too. I grew up in England, not on Mars, but yeah, I've never tried a grilled cheese. And now I have Jill over there, who is literally makes all these events possible, um, has blessed me with the grill, grilled cheese life, oh and I can never go back now. <laughs> so, favorite dessert? Ice cream. Cookie dough. <laughs> Brownies. I'm like, even, even still? Still. Wow. <laughs> I always have this thing, I'm like, if I eat like a ton of bars of chocolate, maybe I'll go off it, but yeah. yeah it just doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wait okay. for that day. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite restaurant? I'm going to narrow it down in New York. Ooh. Um, whoa. Okay. Oh. That's like, I'm like, girl, <laughs> you need to name, like, <laughs> okay, New York, uh, Mesa Coyacan, it's a Mexican restaurant in Brooklyn, and it's probably the only one that I like, Where because I grew up in Mexico, yeah. it's, it's um, in Williamsburg, off of Lorimer, and I'll say it again, because I said Shut it very, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> know it down, it's the best, Mesa, M-E-S-A, and then the second word is Coyoacan. C O Y C. Oh, I'm never gonna sell that. <laughs> Koyo Akan. Try it. <laughs> yeah, so Mesa so and then something, something with a C and a bunch of letters. C O Y O A N. I just, I don't know. Something like that. We'll get it. C O Y O A C A O C. See, Lacey, everybody. <laughs> um, I'll say just. My favorite neighborhood spots, like our go-to, um, are Colony and Rukla in Brooklyn. Oh my God, I have a list of like amazing women-owned spots oh, that I cool. have to tell you guys. Um, if I want something high-end, um, Cosme is amazing. Um, and she just won, uh, Chef Daniela just won um, world's best, uh, 50 best chefs. So a huge accomplishment for women. Um, and then I love Mimi's Diner in Brooklyn, another women-owned spot. Like, she's so amazing. She has this really cool um, menu inspired by fair food right now that's really fun. Delicious. I'm really hungry now. OK. <laughs> um, do you have any words to live by? 
mottos, power phrases. Sprinkles and smiles. <laughs> um, just follow your passion. Mm -hmm. Food connects people. I love it. Okay, so on that note, I feel like we've gotten to know you pretty well, but maybe people in the audience have some other questions. Hi, everyone. Okay, you guys are so inspiring, first of all. Um, do you have any words of advice for that, like, transition time of, like, when you're, when you're like, starting out, first, like, there's so many, I don't want to say haters, but, like, people who are not going to believe in you, and, like, they're like, okay, cute, we'll see you when you're back in your office job. Um, or like just words of encouragement and like how to get through it and like keep keep going. Don't pay attention to the yeah, noise. Yeah, they don't exist. Don't pay attention to the noise. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Look forward. One hundred percent, they don't exist. I think that you should only accept positivity and literally let go of anything else because anyone making you doubt yourself just shouldn't be around you. Period. Like in in anything, not just starting a business. And so I think focus with anyone giving you positivity because that is what you need and don't doubt yourself and don't I don't even know that there's haters <laughs> like ignore them I also think it's sometimes a reflection of what they've been through and maybe people have kind of stifled their dreams and ambitions and goals um, and it, that is it's really sad and it, it's kind of funny but you could almost maybe have a chat with them and just ask them how they're doing because I bet you, <laughs> listen, maybe they wanted to be an astronaut and someone was like, Pfft. like, you don't know what happened in their life. So I think sometimes um, those discussions, I've had quite a few run ins with haters, naysayers as such. And uh, <laughs> sometimes you can have quite constructive conversations and find that actually both of you can grow from figuring out why is it that I'm not able to become a unicorn who sprinkles <laughs> sprinkles everywhere because you can do that um, okay uh, and I also think yeah. that not only just to not listen to them or anything like that but there's there's so I'm just like don't even know how to say it because people like that frustrate me so much but I just think that <laughs> that you also have to kind of accept that what you are and what you are creating isn't for everyone, yes. right? There are so many people who would look at me and say, she's not a real chef. Well, I don't know what a real chef means. Like, yeah. do I buy an apron? Like, what? Like, I don't understand, right? And I don't. I, I wear a jumpsuit because yeah. it's my power suit. So I think that understanding that what you do isn't for everyone, and that's OK. Like. It's totally okay. Yeah, that's such a valid point. I really, really love that. And I think that in any industry, that can be the same way. Recently, personal story, um, I was about to be part of a campaign. I guess this is model industry side. And um, because I often post in my underwear and eating burgers, that's something I like to do, um, I was deemed not enough of a woman of substance to be part of their campaign. So I was like, don't worry, you missed out, it's okay. But you know, for, for people to really make presumptions of the way you dress, how you look, if you have curly hair or straight hair or the color of your skin and, and saying that you don't fit into that category, therefore you can't be that. Um, I think one thing that we have been subliminally taught is if you cannot see, you cannot be. And I just want everyone to just erase that from their mind because quite often if you can't see it, then you need to be that representation. And they need it more than ever for you to stand up and go and do that. So that's such a valid point. Um, do we have any more questions? Hi, my name is Jenny. I just have a question um, as entrepreneurs that are successful. Starting out, what is one like financial tip that you would give? Because I'm sure that you had to be strategic in how you spent your money in order to achieve your goals. So like, what is one tip that maybe you have for everyone else that's starting out to make mm. money? Don't budge on your value and your worth. Like, sometimes you, sometimes like, I found, especially when I was starting out, um, when I would give a, a proposal or quote a price like based on what was happening in the industry, based on what I knew my male colleagues would make for a private gig, I would quote that number and like a lot of times it would be like, oh, like really? Or oh, can you maybe like do it for free? Or can you, this is a great opportunity. Um, you'll get a lot of exposure. Like don't go down that road. Like yes, like those, are there's some times that you might need to make sacrifices. I mean, like 
if Vogue is asking for a cake, like, you you, you, yeah, or like, yeah, whatever. But just know your boundaries and don't budge. Like, and I think that it's a conversation going back to when we started um, this panel discussion around transparency with finances. I think that that narrative starting to shift with people being more transparent about what they're making. Um, and yeah, like, again, just be firm in your value and know your worth, know your time, your time is money, all of that matters. So um, don't let people take advantage of that. Yeah. I think from a, a very financial, not as much value point of view, for me it was very important to, you know, in expanding, and figuring out what I was spending my money on, there was so many things, and, and even now there's so many things like, Every day I'm like, oh my gosh, I really wish I could hire someone that does photos and videos, but like maybe that's not the next hire. And so, or even just when you're buying more materials, like there's so many things that I wanted to do. I wanted to start with like this beautiful website, but it was either like put all my money into that or set up my kitchen by buying all the supplies using free Instagram to then be able to get a website. So I think separating a little bit of what you want the company or, or the business to do and versus what you have to do to get there. And I think those are s different types of sacrifices because they're with yourself, but um, weighing out those options was very important for me because it, it was like what's worth it and what's going to be a longer route to something but yeah. a better route. And I think when you're first starting out and you have nothing, I think you'd be surprised you can do a lot with a little. Mm -hmm. You can I make agree. it work. As someone who's like moved to this country, and I guess I'm classed as the immigrant in this country, the most important thing I ever did was learn about credit scores. It sounds simple, but like really looking into it and figuring it out, and even something silly like I couldn't even get a phone plan because I was self-employed and I didn't really have any history of earnings for a long time. I, I couldn't even have a cell phone in this country. Um, and then I learned about store cards and building up and building my credit on one of those cards where you put some money on and then you buy one thing and then you... So definitely looking into all the ways you can build credit because that's then helped me buy a house here and now I'm funding my own business too. So it's like, I definitely think that credit score and I've, I've met people who have you know, been born and raised here who have a credit score of 500 and they're really struggling. So I definitely think that for me, a credit score was actually vitally important to giving me financial freedom here. So, any other questions? Oh, two at once, double whammy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jen, and thank you guys so much for coming and sharing. My question is, a lot of you guys spoke about how your partners play into so much of how you feel supported and how you spend your time and bounce ideas back and forth with them. How do you balance nurturing your businesses with them and nurturing your relationships with them, whether that be partnership or even friendship, because question. so much of your, your souls are invested in the worlds that you've created for us to enjoy, which is amazing, but then how do you also help your relationships at home? There's, there's a team and there's a goal. And if, as long as you're both on the same team to achieving the goal, then that's really important for me because if we have different goals out of the one business, then you know I can there I can think of so many situations where where we're making a decision. It's not what I want versus what you want. It's what's best for this. And I think that keeping that sort of little triangle of like going up and not like one person or the other person or another thing that really helps us because you know we walk to work together, we work together, we walk home together, we eat dinner together, we share the same friends. And I think that the balance of that, everyone told us it was so scary and whatever, and I was never scared of it. And part of it is because we have very defined roles. So that's very important that I, you know, we agree, I trust you 100% on this list of things and you trust me 100% on this list of things. If we ever have questions for each other, it's more like, hey, I'm asking for advice, but I have final say. And other way around is the same, whether it's a financial advice or I have a creative thing or anything like that. And I think that those boundaries being set so much in stone helps us to never really cross into each other's space because 
I vouched that that's what he was good at and he vouched that that's what I was good at. And that doesn't mean, you know, in just husband, like you said, if you're working with a friend, that's also real important is to know your strengths and trust each other in those. Very interesting. Sounds like the communication is really good as well. Key, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's about being on the same team regardless yeah. of whether it's in business or in life or mm -hmm. whatever the case is. It's like my husband's always on my team and always my biggest cheerleader regardless of whether he agrees with the decision or doesn't or we see eye to eye or not. We're like always on the same team. When you're authentic to yourself, you're going to attract people in your life, whether it's friendships, business partnerships, um, relationships. The people that really care about you will understand mm -hmm. all through the ebbs and flows. Um, and you know, my partner, he's an activist. He's in DC all the time. He's working on the Medicare for All campaign. So he's really busy. Um, and we don't see each other a lot. And we have, we have different uh, kinds of stress, for sure. And so it's important to give space when they need it. Sometimes it's just a let's not talk about Anything, it's just Netflix and chill and just like get takeout and not have to think about anything. Um, sometimes it is celebrating each other's success and that can look different sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't have to be a big moment. It can be a little moment. It can be even just a personal achievement like, hey, um, someone was a jerk to me and I didn't scream in their face or I didn't break down or like I stood my ground when somebody was trolling me on the internet. Like, Whatever it is, um, to be able to, again, have that partnership. And when you have that solid foundation in your relationships, you can only get there is if you have a solid foundation with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that, like, that point couldn't be, oh, my, if you could just take one thing <laughs> home with you tonight, take that piece of information home. Like, be true to yourself and you will attract the right relationships and the people that want to support you. Yeah. And don't be afraid to unfollow in real life those yeah, people who exactly. aren't supporting you. <laughs> and if, you know those weighed down relationships sometimes, if they're friendships or partners, it can, be, it can really take a toll on your own mental health and the health of your business and your work and environment. So check in with yourself as well and check it. Check in if the people are bringing you joy around you and supporting you and lifting you. They're bringing you joy around wow, you. Wow, look at this. I'm like, okay. There you go. No, I really agree with that. I yeah. think unfollowing in real life can be <laughs> emotional, <laughs> emotional vampires. I thought Jill had found some music, like wrap it up. Is there um, I know we had one more yeah. question, so we'll just get your question. She's and up then here. Um, you can have an idea of a business that you want to start. You can be like, yes, actually, this is what I want to do with my life. This is where I'm going to go. And you have basically a goal that you want to get to. So you both left full-time jobs. Did you decide, like, okay, I'm going to save up for six months and then go into this? Did you get, like, a side hustle? What was the transition kind of like? Because there is a definite financial scare like you're like oh my god I'm not going to be getting paid every two weeks or etc so like what was that like for you I started my this, oh, oh, sorry um, I started my business when I was working full-time okay. and so I just did what I could nights and weekends um, and it got to the point where I was I was working in consultancy so I was like traveling and working crazy hours anyways and then spending every other waking moment working on the business. Um, and after a couple weeks, it got to a point where I couldn't juggle both. So I went to my boss and I had a very real conversation. And I, he knew I was starting the business. He was very supportive. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I work for him and I have client work to do. And so I went to him and I just said, I, I was like, look, I don't know what is going on. And I don't, don't know when people quit their job or when they don't quit their job or how they do this. Like, same thing. I need money. I don't even know if this business is going to work. Um, what do I do? And he gave me the flexibility to spend more time on the business. And so I kind of slowly transitioned out of my job. I went down to part time. Um, and, you know, we put some guardrails on my job. And it was like very, it was wonderful that they were able to work with me in that way. Um, but honestly, just have, have a conversation though, because it was like one of those people that had been supporting me and always wanted what's best. And so he was like, of course, we'll figure out a way to keep you here in some capacity. And you know, we don't want to lose you. And then eventually I transitioned out of that role um, slowly. 
So over, yeah, I went down to part time for two months and then went back and I was like, okay, this still isn't enough time. And at that point I felt much more comfortable and confident that I was gonna be able to support myself on, um, on you know, doing the business. But I think just have real conversations and tell them about what you're going through and what you're struggling with. And like, if, I mean, unless your boss is a horrible human, like most, <laughs> most people like can empathize and can be like, okay, well, let's figure this out. I think for, yeah, I think for me it was a little bit different because um, I sort of started somehow the demand before the business, right? I didn't have a logo, uh, a like nothing. I thought I was opening a bakery that was going to have like donuts and muffins and cakes and all of these things. And I just started doing it as my side hustle. Like 100% would just do it on my free time because... I don't have an oven at work. Um, and so I think that starting to do that, and I was just taking on like little cakes here and there. And I started to realize that it was more and more. I was waking up at 5 AM before going to work to work on that. And that's when I started to realize, you know what? Now it's starting to affect my real job or whatever yeah. the day job was. <laughs> um, and and it's, it was something where it was actually like distracting to do both, but I knew that I had a job where I couldn't cut down to part-time or I couldn't do anything like that. So I continued to do it until I felt confident enough and it literally is not something that you like, I can tell you is gonna happen in a week or two weeks. It was a feeling where I woke up and I was like, I can't go to work. Not like I don't want to go to work, but I can't go to work because I have enough business with this now and I believe in myself enough that it will be there tomorrow and it will be there the day after. And if not, I'm going to live like the money's not there until it is. And so I didn't necessarily have a financial plan. I just knew that it was going to work if I just believed in it enough. And so it was a, a long you know, transitioning time because... I was doing both, I, I'm not, a few months of, of it, and then I slowly woke up when I was like, nope, this is it. <laughs> I feel like we've wrapped this beautiful real talk up very nicely. If you have not had any of the delight, delightful little treats we have over there, I definitely think you're going to want to, don't like get aggressive with it though, like, <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> it's going to be enough for everyone. <laughs> I know I'm definitely ready, I should have gotten some before, but <laughs> preoccupied. Um, so no, I just want to thank you all for your time, I really hope you enjoyed this real talk. We're doing many more, um, so tell your friends, tell your people, tell your fam, because we have them coming up Minneapolis. Minnesota, one of the M's. <laughs> I'll be on a plane going to one of the M's on Saturday. <laughs> but I always find my way. <laughs> so we'll be there. And then we're going to be back in New York on the 6th of August. And you're going to get to meet my best friend, Natalie, who's shaking her head. Um, so we've got a lot of real talks. And also volunteer your ideas. Make sure you're engaging with Ari on social. We would love to know what real talks that you'd like to all see. This has been so special and so unique. Um, I feel like this was um, hearing all of your stories and journeys. I'm super inspired right now and hungry. Um, <laughs> so thank you all for your time. Um, come up, you can meet us all, take some pics. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Honored to be with you all. Thank you. Woo!